Okay, are we ready? <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, so let's, uh, we've been talking about different types of mechanisms or, you know, what do we know, what don't we know? Um, let me just introduce um, some kind of like um, mechanisms and concepts we've been, you know, working with for a while. And um, Haka, the Haka mechanism, you've probably heard about it. It is the mechanism, like the main mechanism people have been using to model um, molecular weight growth and to talk about surface growth and all these, and it's a highly useful mechanism. So um, this is a, a so this is a mechanism where you like um, it was introduced by uh, Michael Frankock's group um, uh, many years ago, decades ago, um, and. It basically is, so it's, it, the name of it, the acronym is hydrogen abstraction. The original paper was C2H2 addition, which is acetylene addition. So you could even call it hydrogen abstraction carbon addition. Okay, so um, it's a, a multi-step, but not that many steps, a couple step um, mechanism where you take a hydrogen off of a carbon and then acetylene um, as, is a really, um, uh, is, is one of the most um, concentrated species in a flame. You generate a lot of acetylene. Uh, so acetylene is usually floating around in a flame. So you, once you abstract a hydrogen from your carbon, the acetylene can attach to your species where you abstracted the hydrogen, where you have that radical site, um, and add two carbons with the hydrogen coming off. So, uh, basically, the chemical reaction looks like something like oh, your whatever hydrocarbon species you have plus a hydrogen, you abstract it, and you end up with that radical plus an H2, right? That radical, the acetylene in the second step plus an acetylene attaches to that um, carbon, and with the release of a, a, an H atom, you end up, um, in this case, you generate a ring. Um, some cases, you just generate the the chain, and then a second acetylene comes in and makes a six-membered ring. So um, in this case, you uh, um, did the addition in um, one of these sites that's like a boat. Okay, so um, so that's uh, the um, basic uh, Hawke me mechanism. Um, this is uh, a figure that shows kind of like what you'd get for the Gibbs free energy for this hydrogen abstraction um, carbon addition um, uh, mechanism, where you'd actually showing the growth from, say, a benzene, starting from a benzene, and then sequentially adding um, acetylene to the benzene and growing the species to um, benzene, and then the two ring thing is anaphthalene, and then you grow to um, phenanthrene, that three ring um, structure, to a pyrene. So just by sequentially abstracting hydrogens and adding acetylene, you start to grow these, these multi-ring hydrocarbons. Okay, so this is molecular weight growth. Um, this is not um, inception, right? This is molecular, so this is like, you, you, when in a flame, what you're, you're, if, when this is happening, it's usually happening at higher, high temperature, and you're, you're growing basically all of the hydrocarbons um, at once, right? You're, you're each of those, um, say, ben, say you have a whole bunch of benzene rings, each benzene ring is growing more and more rings. So you have basically distributed um, molecular weight growth of the different gas phase species in the flame. So that's called mo molecular weight growth. When you have inception, now the difference between molecular weight growth and inception is, um, the inception is when you take now all those hydrocarbons and you clump them. Um, so you now are taking gas phase and turning it into a particle by like basically combining them all together. So, it, so you can kind of think about it as, um, say you're sitting out on the mall in, you know, wherever you live, Boston, right? And you have a whole bunch of tables out there and people are, you know, different restaurants in the middle of summer, it's really, Fine. Okay, let's say Paris, and you're and people are sitting out, and you know someone walks by, and they join your group, and you're like so each each little table is getting more and more people, just kind of like chatting and having a nice time, and then a street performer comes out, 
and everyone rushes over to the street performer. There's your inception, okay? So you're going from growth of your individual little groups to like, like what is it that's causing everyone to clump to one spot, okay? So that's what you're trying to figure out. Why is this happening? So, so we're trying to figure out both. How do you get molecular weight growth and how do you get inception? Okay, so, so there are two classes of inception mechanisms. Like you can think of this as um, two kind of like um, ends and in between there are other, you know, like can be a whole bunch of other mechanisms, but there are two like really distinct classes. One is this um, thermodynamically driven like nucleation condensation type of, you know, at the same way you'd get a droplet forming from um, when it rains. When it's humid outside and it starts to rain, your, your water vapor is clumping up into droplets, right? That's your thermodynamically driven um, type of mechanism. So what you're trying to figure out is why are your gas phase species clumping up into your droplets in, in the flame, right? Um, what is causing them? They're not, they're kind of like water, you, va you can vaporize it back into a vapor, right? This would be the same type of thing. You're just like physically binding their electrostatic bonds. Um, you're not actually covalently binding them with sharing electrons between bonds, right? Um, so we call that bound by dispersion forces. So dispersion force is like a van der Waals force between nonpolar um, molecules, okay? So, and then the other class is um, this kinetically controlled type of reactions causing um, covalent bond formation. Um, that in the end, you have, so you have uh, reactions that are making covalent bonds, so your particle at the end is now covalently bound, and you can't just vaporize it. It's more like the phase transition that happens when you bake a cake, and you're going from a liquid to a solid, you're not gonna go back to a liquid, right? So this is like a very different type of, of mechanism. So the question is, what's, are we having kinetic or thermodynamically driven um, uh, type particle formation? So let's look at the different um, uh, types of mechanisms. This is from Hai Wang's paper, his review paper. This is a great paper, actually. It was written in 2011, came out in 2011 from the proceedings, um, one of the review papers. Um, here are three uh, different types of mechanisms. On the bottom, uh, on A is um, uh, you basically have this covalently like adding, adding, adding probably CO2, maybe Hakka type formation of these like curved type of structures, possibly going into buckyballs or other fullerene type structures. Um, uh, and then in the second, so in that one, we can pretty well say that it's not happening. It's too slow, that mechanism is too slow. We don't see this type of product normally and um, the carbon to hydrogen ratio for this type of one particle formation is way too high. So carbon hydrogen ratio would be way, way over two. And that's not what we see, okay? Um, the second um, mechanism is now our, nu our, the one I said was thermodynamically driven. You basically condense pHs or something um, into uh, particles. So that's, or, or nucleate, you know, we, we might call it nucleating those into particles. Um, the, and um, theory has shown that in order to get this type of nucleation at flame temperatures where you see inception, it's gonna take um, pretty large species, usually o larger than 11 aromatic rings to form this. So the question is, can that be happening in the flame? Do we have species large enough? Or is there something else that's causing those species to be less volatile so that they want to um, uh, nucleate? So, um, and that could be something like, you know, it does it have oxygen? Does oxygen want to cause these things to be attracted to each other? Um, is it aliphatic side chains that's causing them to be attractive? Are they radicals? Are the radicals the ones that are, want to be attracted? So there's a ton of work in this area trying to figure out what's going on there. So um, in order to have something that's larger, if we just have plain um, PAHs that are kind of nucleating, so if you go back to our uh, stabilomer grid, this would be way over, so I, I know, remember I put the number of six-member rings at the top in blue? 
Um, this would be way over to the right-hand side of our figure here, our chart. Um, and that has a really high um, carbon to hydrogen ratio. These are large species, and we actually don't even see them in flames normally. Right? So, so this um, indicates, this doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, but it indicates, at least under atmospheric pressure, it's not happening. Um, so um, the carbon to hydrogen ratio is greater than 2.4, as probably not the main mechanism for soot formation, for inception. OK. So um, in addition, as you go up, let's see, as you go up, um, the binding, so this is why people think it's over that, over the larger, larger than 11 um, rings, why the big you know, uh, part, particle masses are good for this type of mechanism. As you go up in number of aromatic rings, um, the binding energy increases. So you basically have more attraction between these, these molecules. So that's on the top curve um, plot. On the, on the bottom plot, we see um, the, uh, the red curve is the binding sublimation temperature, and that increases because these things are attracted to each other, right? This is thermodynamics. Because the larger species are more attracted to each other, the binding energy is higher, then the sublimation temperature is going to be higher, okay? Or the vaporization temperature is going to be higher. Okay. Um, so that increases with the number of carbon atoms. Um, and, but on the other hand, the concentration of these species, for each additional ring you add, it decreases exponentially. So these larger species are just not as concentrated in the flame. So even if you could you know, somehow get one of these, these two things together, they're not going to find each other very well. And they're probably not going to be responsible, at least this mechanism is not going to be responsible, fully responsible for inception. OK? So, um, is, so here's a figure. If you've been studying, so you've probably seen this figure multiple times. This is an experiment where they sucked the particles right out of the flame, right? Um, and they did the mass spec on the particles themselves. And they see this interesting, these interesting um, humps in the mass spectrum of the particle. Um, and it kind of indicates that you have, on the left-hand side, you have all these, like, what we would typically see if you're going to vaporize the particle. You see, like, all those peaks. And then you see, like, almost like you're adding layers onto the, onto the particle. This doesn't mean that you're seeing all those individual um, um, sheets in your mass spectrum. You're actually adding them onto the particles, so seeing the entire... Um, particle itself. So this is a really interesting experiment, um, but I'm, I'm not sure if I've seen it reproduced. Um, and it would be really nice if someone reproduced it and, and delved into what was going on. Um, it's a really interesting experiment. Uh, so this is the, the same group. And what they saw is if they ionize, so on the left-hand um, side of graph, um, this is ionizing with um, 248 nanometers and a mass spectrum from the particle. So the particle and you ionize the 248 nanometers. Um, and then they see actually what, what you normally see in a mass spectrum, aerosol mass spectrum, or laser desorption ionization mass spectrum, where you collect the sample and then you like vaporize it somehow and then ionize. That's very typical of what you see. But if you ionize at um, a shorter wavelength, where you might be actually a more able to ionize the particle, you actually see. Um, these larger masses. And I think that's because you're actually starting to see the entire, you're seeing the entire particle almost like grow between. And it would be nice if you could have these data at different heights in the flame. Like this would be a really cool experiment. But it, I, I don't, they didn't seem to do that um, measurement. Okay, so, um, so let's go back to this guy. Um, so, okay, so this one is, we don't think is, is happening. Um, and this one may be happening, but we need to figure out a way that it could be happening, but it, you know, our data could seem to indicate that it's not. Um, and this one, um, at the top, this is covalently binding um, different, so this is the kinetic mechanism, the kinetically controlled mechanism. So that one may be happening, and um, 
And we think that it probably is. At least I do. So this is, I'm going to say, like this is this is Hope's theory um, that um, we we're gonna that it's it, I think it's the kinetically controlled one. Okay, so because um, I think the other ones seem to have a lot of issues, and we have a lot of evidence that this is what's happening. So let me just go into a little bit more detail on that. Okay, so here's another paper, a, a review paper that just came out last year by um, a Martin et al. Uh, this um, Marcus Crafts group. Um, kind of going into all the different mechanisms that have been published in the literature. Okay, so um, so there are they went there are a whole bunch of them. So um, the top one we just talked about that's the nucleation one. It seems like the carbon to hydrogen ratio is too large, um, and the density is too low for these species to be large species to be around, unless there's some other way to make them more less volatile. Um, and then the second one to the right is the, the kinetically controlled one that, um, that I'm voting for. Okay, so um, the ones over to the left, um, those are just too slow. Like the bo bottom left one is the one that was, I showed you from Hai Wang's paper. Um, the first one we talked about that, you know, make the curve, you know, probably through a Hakka type mechanism. Um, we think that's just too slow. Um, and these other ones, the carbon to hydrogen ratio, if you get species that are like huge, your carbon to hydrogen ratio is just going to be too large, right? We just don't see that in a flame. Um, okay, so, uh, so let's talk about the, now the ones over to the uh, lower right, so where it says CPAH, that means curved PAH. So the FPAH up at the top right, that means flat PAH. The, so, so the question is, if you have a curved PAH, can you have a dipole moment because your PAH is curved? So how do you think you could get a curved PAH? Any ideas? I know you know this because you've looked at a soccer ball before, a football. Yes, you have five-membered rings. If you embed, yes, thank you. What was your name again, Tanner? Dalton. Dalton. Okay, Dalton. Okay, I am, I am it's hard. okay, I'm going to remember Dalton. Yes. I should remember that. That's a good name. Um, okay, so, so you're going to, as, as soon as you embed a five-membered ring, you can get curvature, right? Like you look at a soccer ball, it has five-membered rings embedded in all that those six-membered rings, right? Okay. Um, so, so here's the theory: you have like a dipole moment associated with this curvature. Um, and here's a, a theoretical study um, that you know kind of assesses what is the binding energy for these different um, molecules, whether they're flat or curved. Okay. So they went through, and let me just point out a couple of them. So this one's coronine, that one's flat, okay? And then um, this one is coranuline, and that one is curved. Um, they're not exactly the same size, but they're close. Um, and you notice that actually curvature doesn't seem to have a big effect, even though, even though they calculate that the dipole moment for coranuline should be comparable to water, um, and higher than for chlorine. So, well, it didn't, you know, it's a, it was a good idea, but it didn't actually work. Um, so it turns out that, um, that the binding energy is, is similar for the two, um, and, uh, and it just didn't help. On top of the fact that when we do the experiments, when we look at the, the mass for um, coranuline and chlorine, we actually don't see coranuline or chlorine. I don't know what they actually are, but they're not those species. So they're not the stabilomers. Yes. So why do you think that we ha do have kinetics or don't have kinetics, kinetically? Yes. 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 Uh, 
I, yeah, I think they, it is kinetic. I think it's chemistry, right? Why is the chemistry slow? Oh, here's why the chemistry is slow. is because um, uh, for, okay, let's go back to the one where I said chemistry is too slow for that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, this one at the bottom left, like why, I mean, why is that chemistry too slow? Okay, look at that particle that you're actually forming on the right-hand side. If you say, okay, I want to get to the point where I have a particle. That chemistry that would cause that formation is probably something like the Hakka mechanism. Okay, so now you're taking um, a molecule and you're repeatedly, so now instead of doing, like, you're repeatedly adding, you're trying, you're extracting a hydrogen, you're adding a carbon, you're extracting a hydrogen, adding a carbon, you know, so you're repeatedly doing this. Um, so in order for that to, so you have a whole bunch of steps is, is causing that to happen. We call that sequential growth, molecular weight growth. Um, on top of the fact that a lot of the species that are like have these like closed um, shell six membered rings are pretty stable. So to get over a barrier, the barriers are relatively high. To get over the barrier, the reactions are relatively st slow. Where you have soot inception temperatures, this will this like these uh, these um, the soot uh, these Hakka type mechanisms are faster at high temperatures. Uh, that's after where you have inception. It's lower, yeah. Okay. Where you see inception, it's lower temperatures. Not, not the high, not like 2,000 Kelvin or 1,500 Kelvin, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's right. It's like in that high temperature regime, yeah, so it's, it, you need to be faster at lower temperatures than inception, yeah. Okay, yeah. Good question, that's an excellent question. Okay, so, so we think this is not happening. Um, the density is too low for these to begin with, and um, the carbon hydrogen ratio is just too high. And and they the people who did this, you know, Mar Marcus's group um, concluded that. Like it, I'm not judging their work. They they actually conclude, made that conclusion. Okay, um, so um, and I want to okay here. So um, so. Uh, okay, so here's another set they had in that same paper, right? Um, the upper left-hand corner with polyine, um, so you basically have um, a whole bunch of, um, like, acetylene, like, lumping together um, type of mechanism. That, that we don't see. Um, it's, that's just not observed, so we can rule that guy out. Um, the bottom two left ones are a kinetically controlled type mechanisms. I think those are possible. Um, the, um, uh, the upper, the, those three that on the right, those are not inception mechanisms. Those are dimerization mechanisms. So yes, those you could have dimerization mechanisms, but that's not the same as inception. Inception would be dimer plus growth plus, you know, plus, you know, it's, it's, um, it's kind of like you're sitting at your tables and, and okay, two, two groups actually um, notice each other and go, hey, look who's over there, and then they get together. That doesn't mean everyone else is going to come around and, and get together with them, right? So, so you have to be careful. When someone says they see dimerization, that does not, unless they have a follow-on mechanism that says, oh, we're going to keep growing, we're going to keep sucking in all the carbons, be careful because people sometimes confuse dimerization with inception. Okay, and you see this over and over and over and over again in modeling papers. Like we do inception by pyrene dimerization. So you just have to be very careful with, with like think be be look at it carefully when you see that. Okay, so um, and then the right hand is a possible. The right hand is basically the kinetically controlled for if it were smaller species. Okay, so let's let's um, talk a little bit more about that. Um, okay, we're back to here. Our two kind of classes of mechanisms. So I think that here on the left-hand side, the species are too small to condense or nucleate or whatever you, however you want to say it, um, at this, these inception temperatures. Actually, inception temperatures, I think this 1,400 to 1,700 Kelvin comes from measurements, and I think those are really, those are really hard measurements. 
how do you know when the particles have been, when you get inception? You have to be able to measure the incipient particles, and that's a really hard measurement to make. So I think actually it's at low, much lower temperatures when you see particle inception. Um, so that's another thing. Figure out how to measure incipient particles. Um, uh, and then um, reactions between uh, stable precursors are too slow. Um, and remember, dimerization is not the same as inception. OK. So what are, the, what are the possibilities now? Let's go back in the literature and see what other people, what people have proposed for um, chemical um, covalent um, particle inception. OK. Here's a nice mechanism where you start out with, those are RSRs up at the upper left-hand corner, um, cyclopentadienyl and um, um, uh, indineal, right? Um, those have radical, so it's radical, radical reactions, generate another species, and then that continues to react. And in, in the process, you end up generating a whole bunch of different radicals, um, and this one, this is, this is molecular weight growth, but you can imagine that maybe that um, mechanism could keep going. But in the end, what you end up with here is um, two closed shell, very stable species that are probably not all that reactive, right? So now you've hit a dead end, right? So now you have to figure out how to excite those again. Um, they're, not, they're not prone to be, like they're not in the configuration to generate an RSR. So these are hard to like activate again to get them going. OK, um, so here's another mechanism again. Um, we're starting with naphthalene, pretty stable species, you know, generating a radical out of it, reacting with asnaphalene, um, and then generating. But now you can see, like, maybe in this case, you can regenerate a radical. Um, it's not an, an RSR, but, but maybe this is a way to keep the reaction going if you, have, you end up with a radical product, right? OK, so, um, so this is another potential inception mechanism. Um, here's a mechanism that was just published recently. Um, this comes from um, Mani Sarathi's group. Um, this was published like last week, I think. So it's not in your notes because I added it because it wasn't, you know, just came out. Um, so, uh, so this is pyrene dimerization. Um, so it's, it's like, and, and um, so on the upper left-hand um, uh, is, a, is a mechanism um, for physical pyrene dimerization. What people talk about all the time is, is pyrene nucleating, which we know doesn't happen. Like it's not nucleating in a flame at these temperatures. Um, it's just not thermodynamically stable. Um, the upper right-hand one is um, a mechanism that was proposed by um, Andrea Diana's group um, with a... Uh, Propaneal, so a radical, pro, um, sorry, radical pyrene, pyreneal, um, uh, physically um, dimerizing with a pyrene. So there's an attraction because one of them's a radical, right? So that that's a little bit that's hard to do because it's pretty stable um, to pull off a hydrogen. But if you're at high enough temperature, maybe you have it happen enough times. And then um, Mani Sarathi's group proposes that you generate this you know, attraction, and then you have enough time for them to react. So now you have a covalently bound pyrene-pyrene um, type of dimer. So it, can you think of any reason why this is not um, a really important mechanism in set formation? Just based on what I've told you. Yeah. Yeah, and and um, what's one reason why it wouldn't um, react a lot? It wouldn't. Yeah, and you actually have to have pyrene rather than fluoranthine too, right? Like especially if you like, we might have some pyrene, but not a lot of pyrene. If you if a lot of it's fluoranthine, um, but it may be that at some you know some of them may like do that, and you end up with a dimer, right? So. This isn't something we should rule out. The fact is that we don't even see mass 404 in our mass spectra. So we don't see this dimer. But you know, it's possible that it can happen. But, um, but you're right. I think that the fact that 
you're not seeing you're not seeing a lot of the pyrene. You're not you know, it, and it's also pretty stable. Coast shell, very stable molecule. So, but it's possible that it does happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, oh yeah, this is what they, and it turns out that when they do the calculations, it happens at pretty high temperature. If it happens, it happens at pretty high temperature. Um, so you're like, um, but not super high, right? 1100 Kelvin, you could, that's probably not too far from the inception region, right? So, you know, it's possible that it does happen. But, um, okay, so. RSRs. So these are gas phase measurements of radical species of, of species in a flame, um, and you see there are a couple of RSRs here in the gas phase. So you actually can see them in the gas phase. They're there. They're there. So the question is, how important are they in in SIF formation, and should we start to think about how to to incorporate them? Okay. So here's your fluoronil, um, and you have indonil. So fluoronil is is we see we see this mass. Huge, like it's huge for us. 165, we all we see it all the time, and it's huge. And this is one of the main peaks that other people see. So if you're looking for a mechanism, if you're trying to think of something, this is a good mass to start with. Like, what's happening with this mass? Why do we always see it, and what's it doing? Okay. Um, and this is an experiment that was done by Niels Hansen's group, um, where they extracted from a flame. Um, I know I'm just throwing a lot of data at you. I, so like absorb as much as you can and start thinking about how to put it all together and make a story because that's where we are right now. Um, so this is from Niels Hansen's group where you, they extracted from a flame um, and did um, this mass spec where they did um, collision-induced dissociation. So they, they basically extracted from a flame, um, uh, ionized and then slammed their ions into the gas, uh, gas, gas in a gas cell. And they could um, control how fast, you know, how much uh, kinetic energy they used to slam their molecules into the gas phase. Um, so here they did one to five EV collision energy. So it was um, somewhere in the range of one to five EV of energy of the ions that they generated slamming into these um, uh, argon or whatever gas, they, I can't remember which gas they used in this gas cell. Um, and you can see a whole bunch of peaks. So this is relatively low energy, um, collision energy, but they, they saw a whole bunch of peaks. Some of those peaks were RSRs, I've labeled them. Okay, they're the, dark, the darker ones, the blue ones. If they used higher collision energies, Boom, a lot of those other peaks went away, and look what happened. The RSRs popped out, right? What does that mean to you? Do you have any ideas? I know it's late in the day. It's been many hours of people talking at you. But if you're, if you're, if you saw the, these, this result, like you slammed your, your molecules into the, this gas and you saw like a lot of the piece went away, but these ones stuck. Okay, were you yawning or raising your hand? <laughs> okay, so just think about it. Say, say you had like, um, two benzenes stuck together, um, and they were mass what one forty one, like one fifty six, right? And then um, low energy, they're one fifty six, and then you slam them harder into um, an argon, and boom, right? Then you'd basically get phenyl. I, I should have done an RSR. Okay, an RSR, like cyclopentadiene, cyclopentadienyl, right? Um, two C5s, uh, so that's what, 65, mass 65, two of them, 130, 140. Okay, so you see mass 40 in your mass spectrum, you know, low energy, you know, slam into it, nothing happens, high energy, boom, and you put, break apart, and now you have cyclopentadienyl. It kind of, so the way they interpreted the results is it indicated that what they had in the particles they extracted were bound 
um, species that looked like when they broke apart, it, they could they could had larger they had larger curve covalently bound things that they could break apart into um, RSRs. Um, so they concluded that they had a lot of like um, bound you know covalently linked um, species of uh, RSRs, or actually I think they might have said others. Things. But I interpret it as RSRs, so I think they are RSRs. Um, but they um, interpret it as bridged and, and branched things, okay, that broke apart when the energy was high enough. Okay, so there's more evidence that you have RSRs that are bound together in these particles. Okay, so what's the mechanism that would allow you to do this? So here's a proposal. And this is just a hypothesis at this point. So this is a paper we published a few years ago um, where we said, okay, we, have, we see all these RSRs. What we think might be happening is uh, we have an RSR, it reacts with something. And this is an example, just we did fennel, but we did a whole bunch of other like, types of examples in, um, in the paper. Um, but this, uh, um, so indonyl is an RSR, it reacts with fennel. Um, it generates this adduct. Um, this adduct, um, so remember how you stabilize, why aromatics are stable is because they have, they are able they ha to have, um, to share their electron density with, with um, their, with bonds, with double bonds, the, the pi orbitals and double bonds, right? So that stabilizes and make these things really, like rock solid, you know, it's hard to break them apart. Okay, so in the middle here, um, in the, ad the adduct between the um, indonyl and the phenyl um, is a bond that is not, um, is what we call C CP3, so it's a carbon with three atoms on it. So it's singly bonded to two carbons and two hydrogens. If you pull off a hydrogen, now you're gonna have a, a radical with an electron that can pop into a, the p orbital on that carbon and then interact with all the pi orbitals. So basically, popping off a hydrogen on that, C, um, that uh, tetrahedral or CP3 um, hybridized carbon will give you an RSR back. So what this does is a reaction that regenerates an RSR. And it looks like the barriers are low enough that that hydrogen can just come off on its own. It doesn't even have to be abstracted. So the barriers act, so the hydrogens can go off on their own. So now you're generating hydrogens, hydrogen atoms, which are radicals. You're generating a new ra RSR radical in this whole reaction. And so this is basically a chain reaction. So it's like a polymerization. So we're kind of like rapidly polymerizing the carbon that's um, in the, the flame and generating a particle. And this is how you could get a disordered um, structure, okay? So this is just a hypothesis and now we're trying to figure out if it's right. So now we're trying to work on, okay, how do we verify it? We have some theoretical estimate, you know, I, you know what, okay, what we don't have, so we have some theory that suggests it should be work. We have some experiments that show that we have all these RSRs in the, associated with the particles. Um, we don't have a model, a kinetic model, because in order to run a kinetic model, you have to have rate constants, right? We don't have rate constants for any of these reactions that could be happening, right? So now we have to go figure out how do we generate these rate constants. So, so we'll be talking a little bit more about that. But, um, and we also need experiments. Like, is, is this even, okay, we have, um, we see the RSRs, but is there a way that we can kind of really test this, this hypothesis? Okay, this, hi this hypothesis is called the Cherkovitz mechanism, which is a clustering of hydrocarbons by radical chain reactions. Okay, so, um, and what we think is we have these um, uh, resonance stabilized radicals. They get, you have a chain reaction, they quickly generate an, um, an incipient particle. And then we also think that um, we have RSRs that are associated with the particle itself, and maybe that's how we're getting surface growth. That is total, total speculation, total hypothesis out there. Um, so we, we need to figure out all of this. Um, 
and and we're we're working on other a lot of other people are working on this. Um, a lot of people are trying to prove it's wrong. Um, that's okay. Um, that's okay. Um, okay. So what's our evidence? Um, I don't want to run over. Like this is uh, we're at, we end at five thirty, I think. Okay. So we're gonna. So if I if I get close, just start waving because. I get too excited about this stuff. Okay, so let's do a pyrolysis experiment. Remember, SMPS allows us to get um, particle size distributions, right? Okay, so this is a figure that shows if we take ethylene. So we normally run ethylene flames. It's a really good sooting fuel. It's been studied a lot. A lot of people in our community study it. Um, so, uh, so we do pyrolysis of ethylene. It's been done 100 times before. No one's really done the looking at um, the um, mass spec, so we're, I'll show you some mass spec in a minute. Um, but, so here's the SMPS at a number of temperatures, so that's on the, the axis that's going back over to the right. Mobility size, so there's size distributions as a function of temperature. So the temperature is color-coded, okay? So you see that there are no particles, we don't see particles in the SMPS at temperatures below about 1100, okay? So we don't, we just don't see particles for ethylene at those temperatures. But we do see them and they grow. And the size distribution, like you see that the particles are growing in size as you go up in temperature, okay? Okay, so what we did is we added, so we did this experiment also with, with indine. We just took indine. Indine, remember, makes indenil. So it's a, what we call a direct precursor to an RSR. So notice that we see, um, particle formation in much lower temperatures for, ind for indine. So we generate indenil, and it generates, it starts to generate particles, right? Okay, so right there, it's like, okay, that's good. We kind of predicted that something like that would happen if we did in indine. You know, according to our theory, we should have particles starting at, it more easily form particles with indine than with ethylene. Okay, um, so, and, so, yeah. Just, that's what I just said, and that's an RSR, right? Okay, so now what does it look like with the mass spec, right? Why are we, so now we can go to the mass spec, the aerosol mass spec, and say, oh, why, why is this happening? Can we, can we show what's happening? Okay, so here's the mass spec on the left for ethylene. Notice there are no particles. When there are no particles, we don't see signal, okay? When we have particles, we see signal. Okay, so we don't see particles at the lower temperatures, only at the higher temperatures. Indine, we see particles at all these temperatures. We see signal at all those temperatures. But we have isolated little clumps of signals, one right there and one right there. Um, it's hard to see this on this slide. Um, but, but let me show you the mass spectra at these temperatures. OK. OK, so ethylene on the left, indine on the right at 1073 Kelvin. OK, no signal of ethylene. We have signal for indine um, on the right-hand side. Indenil is mass 115, okay, and you see the indenil peak. Okay. Um, so, let's see. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait. I was going to show you this. Okay. Yeah. Um, if we go up to higher temperatures, now we see ethylene pyrolysis. Um, at 1173, we see a whole bunch of peaks because it's now starting to form particles. Um, and indine, actually, indenil, indine looks the same, about the same. Um, okay. If we take a little tiny bit of indine and put it into ethylene, so now we seed the ethylene with indine. So we seed the in, eth, indine ethylene with a little bit of RSR. We start to see particles at the lower temperature. So. Um, so it's like, oh, well, that's, that's kind of a good thing, like, compared to, like, if we're trying to see that our theory is right, like, oh, that means that just a little bit of RSR is starting to seed particle formation with ethylene. Okay, so we have this little bit of mixture, and what's interesting is, if you see at 1073 Kelvin for the indine alone and for the ethylene plus indine, it's not just indine that's reacting. The indenil has to be reacting with the ethylene, uh, with, with ethylene. Ethylene isn't falling apart yet, so indenil has to be reacting with ethylene to generate particles, because we see other peaks that are coming up 
in there that we don't see under just indine alone. So it's not just indine reacting with itself, okay? So, so that's actually kind of fascinating. Um, so we see also under, for the indine, we see the 115 peak. We see um, two indenils making the 230 peak. We see three indenils. We actually see four indenils too. I just didn't put it on here. Um, and then our mass spec, you know, doesn't see anything else. Um, uh, but, you know, we also see those same peaks actually at, um, for the mixture, um, but they're not at actually all that big, right? So it's the indenil is reacting with the ethylene, we think, in that mixture. Okay, cool. So that kind of is really kind of convincing that maybe something like this is working. Um, okay. And, and that the radicals are, are reacting with a closed shell species. The radicals are reacting with ethylene, with, which is closed shell, it's not a radical. So that means it could be sucking up a whole bunch of the hydrocarbons, yeah. Oh, um, it's like, um, uh, it's, uh, you would ask something like so hard. Um, <laughs> uh, is, um, it's like a maybe 5% by um, a number of, of indine in ethylene, and then it's diluted in, in um, argon, yeah. So it's massively diluted. It's, only, it's actually not that much ethylene. It's um, massively diluted in argon. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's kind of a fun experiment. So what happens? I don't. I'm not going to run. I'm not going to run over. So um, if we have uh, other RSRs, so we can do this with propene and propyne. Propyne is nice because it makes propargyl. Propargyl is a very important molecule in combustion. You probably heard about propargyl and benzene and, it's, and, and the, the drama associated with it. So propargyl plus propargyl is likely what, what people think causes benzene formation in a flame. So propargyl is a nice RS, it is an RSR. Um, so we can take uh, propine, generate propargyl. Propene also generates an RSR called allyl. Um, so they're very similar. The barrier to generating um, propargyl from propine is higher than the barrier for generating allo for propene. Okay, so you might expect more particles, easier soot formation from propene than propine. Um, okay, so, um, sorry. So um, here it is. Even though, like, okay, so propine has a lower um, particle formation temperature than propene, even though the barrier for allo formation is lower for propene than for propine. So there's something magical about propargyl. Propargyl is, is a happy molecule. Um, it, so, so this is, this is a, an interesting um, uh, observation, and we don't understand it. Okay, so this is another one of those things that we're working on. Um, and other people are working on, so it's kind of a fun, fun result. Um, but we we're we're gonna we're gonna nail it. We're gonna figure it out. Um, okay. So just looking in more detail at the mass spectra, um, this is at at three different temperatures: the lowest at the top, highest at the bottom. And notice that on on these mass spectra, for each um, number of carbons, there at the lowest temperature, there's a distribution of peaks. Um, so the um, peak with the highest carbon to hydrogen ratio would be on your left because each of those peaks on the right is adding a hydrogen atom to the, that mass, whatever the number of carbons. So it'd be like kind of like um, 18 carbons with a, a distribution of number of hydrogens. Okay, and then as you go up in temperature, those collapse to the lowest, to the um, least number of carbons. Does that make sense? You're supposed to all go, yeah, yeah, it does, yeah. Because remember, as we're going up in temperature, like we saw this result before, right? We saw this result. Like as we go up in hydrogen, in, in temperature, we eliminate those hydrogens and we come collapse back down to like pericondensed um, pH probably, something like that. We rearrange and get rid of hydrogens and we start to be a happy pH. Okay, 
So that's for propene, propopine. Um, uh, 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 this is for propene, see the same things. Um, so uh, the exact same thing, you have clusters of peaks up at the top at the lowest temperatures, you go up in temperature, and we collapse that back down to the lowest mass, the highest carbon to hydrogen at a particular carbon. Um, okay, so that's all making sense, that's all good. But the interesting thing is, we actually have a lot of aliphatic character, right? What is causing? It's extra hydrogens. How would you get that aliphatic branching, right? All those extra, you know, um, branches that add hydrogen onto your your whatever your molecule. Okay, um, so we think that these are, are examples of that of that happening. Okay, um, and now we see for propene and propine the same RSRs, right? This is the lower lower um, masses. We see the same RSRs. Um, and um, so at, at the particle onset temperatures, um, we see the same types of distributions of not exactly the same RSRs we see in the flame, like all the flames, like m many of the flames, but we see a lot of them. Um, again, 165 is huge. So if you figure that one out, let me know. Let me know what's going on there. Um, OK, so let's see. Um, OK, I'll go for a couple minutes, but I'm not going to go over. Not going to go over. OK, so we saw this one before. Um, again, this is the number of carbon hydrogen, carbons. Um, and the carbon to hydrogen ratio is the lowest for the largest masses, right? So you get that distribution for the largest masses, right? Because you can have that um, carbon, you, you have a lot more, probably a lot more branching at, at um, these higher masses. And I think that might be what's going on. Um, and that dashed line is if you took the stabilomers and you added up the carbon to hydrogen ratio for the stabilomers for each of the numbers of carbons. Okay? Okay. Um, oh yeah, that's what I just said, that the large, um, Larger species are more saturated, they have more hydrogen, right? Saturated means having more hydrogen, um, okay? Uh, the, uh, and it decreases with temperature, as we've said before, right? We keep seeing this, this is uh, an interesting thing. Um, and that it's not driven by entirely by um, thermodynamics, right? It's not that the most thermodynamically stable species by a long shot at these, um, at these different uh, masses. Okay, so, so there's something that's going on that's keeping us from sinking into those thermodynamic wells and staying there. We're, we have some kind of mechanism that's like dynamic. It's exciting. Things are reacting, right? So we're making particles. Um, okay, so uh, sorry if I'm yelling at you. Um, okay, so these resonantly stable, uh, stabilized radicals may be um, driven, um, the inception may be driven by radical chain reactions. Okay, so um, I think I'll stop there um, because it's a good stopping place for today. And then we'll pick up on how do you model this? Like the next step is like how would you put this into a model? What would be the first steps? Because right now no one's modeling it um, because we haven't actually gotten to the point where we can. Okay, so are there any questions on any of this? Um, you're, and if you just really want to speak into this, the microphone. Okay, so remember to meet each other. Remember to say hi if you haven't, if there's someone in here you don't know, walk over and say hi, my name is. <laughs> um, these are your colleagues for the future. Um, these are people who are gonna help you and you can help them. It's gonna be fun, okay?